sitting here with Mark Blackburn, old friend. I think it's taken, what, four years to get you on this podcast? Tell me about that. <laughs> what was the delay? He just, did I have to hit a certain threshold number of episodes in order for you to get are on? Are you a million downloads yet? Yeah, we are. That's an acceptable number. That was number. the acceptable number? Okay. So here we are sitting at the back deck of the Legacy Golf Course. So if you hear some background noise or you're watching on YouTube, um, just they're doing some maintenance out here, but the setting is too good. Um, I wanted to get you on to talk about player development because you come from a perspective of seeing sports in many different areas and you look at golf coaching kind of different than other coaches. What's your perspective and development of the player? Uh, well, person first. So develop the person, figure out who am I dealing with as an athlete, golfer, and then what are their goals, and then kind of reverse engineer it. So I start with the end in mind, what do they want to do? So loads of questions on the front end, try and understand the person, what they want, how they're trying to go about their business now. Mm -hmm. Most of the time when people come and see me, it's because they're struggling. There's not it's, something going good. No, people right. don't generally come see you when it's amazing and say, hey, I just like a consultation. Can you just validate why I'm doing right. these things right. really well? Throw some new things in my head. I'm feeling really comfortable. I just need to make it harder. Yeah. yeah. So it's one of those things where you're trying to get a really good understanding of their perspective. So I think perspective is everything. Like why do they think they, the way they think? What are they trying to do? So once we have all that, now I'm going to look at, okay, physically, what do you do? Okay, does your desired outcome line up with what you can do physically, mm -hmm. your mental outlook, and then you sort of your, if you like, motivation, your work ethic, and all those other things. So lots of times people come to see you and they come to see me mm -hmm. and they have these really big goals, but they're not always willing to do what's necessary to accomplish the goals. So what, what, in your mind, what's behind that? Because I agree with you. People come in and they're like, I want that. I want to climb that mountain. I don't even know where to start. And I also don't know where it, what it takes, but I want you to make me climb that mountain. That yeah. doesn't work. No. Well, most of the time people's expectation is that they're going to go see somebody and there's going to be a magic pill or a magic bullet. And all of a sudden they're just going to, greatness is going to occur. And the reality is that it's nothing further from the truth. Now, lots of times people have lots of the attributes necessary and there can be one thing that's oh, missing and you can kind of enter that into their repertoire and be all of a sudden that can be have a huge be a big catalyst for amazing things that doesn't happen very often yeah. but we only hear about those successes and people are always watching and observing what everybody else does and so if someone else does it oh well that's the way I should do it and I think lots of times people have this belief that you're just going to lay the hands on them so to speak and one thing's going to happen because you see that over and over again and the best players in the world when you work with those guys they're able to do things quite quickly now whether they're willing to actually listen to you whether there's a connection between the two of you and whether they can assimilate the information i think that's that's a and huge that, part but that's an it. interesting place to take a dive in the best players in the world do things that you and i don't even do and yet they're asking us to coach them. Me to coach them on the mental side, you to coach them on the whole person side. Body, swing, mechanics, mental, everything, okay? So we're the best players in the world are doing things and walking fairways that you and I have never walked. Yep. That's often sometimes a little bit of a challenge because it'd be like explaining somebody how to go to the moon if you've never actually ever gone to the moon. Right. Yeah. How do you handle that in your teaching? Well, I think from a, so I came from a playing background. Now, I didn't play on the tour, played mini tours, played in a lot of events. So, so you have experience, like golf is golf. Now, yeah. when the music and the noise get louder and louder, the bigger the, the bigger the stage, so to speak, things change. But now you have a lot of experience over 16 years coaching players on the major championships. It's like, okay, well, I've been in this situation before. This is what other players have expressed. So now you can use that. So great coaches are great storytellers, right? So you take that information and you try and relay it and you're always trying to reframe a situation to make somebody comfortable. And I think when you haven't been there actually hitting the shot, but you've had a lot of experience helping other people be there and when other people have been as successful, that's kind of validation like, okay, well your information is accurate, I'm going to listen to you. And so I always try and approach it from 
I don't know what it's going to feel like to you, but here's what other people have expressed. Here are other situations I've been through so that you give them the voice of reason and a perspective from somewhere else that's been through it to try and relax them. But they've, you know, they do things differently. Yes, most of them are all very, very driven, but they're driven in ways to which they're comfortable with. What I find the hard part is to really get someone to elevate their game and to get better is you have to make them be comfortable being uncomfortable and willing to be vulnerable because people don't want to work on the areas that are really good. Now, the greats do. Yeah, the greats if you look, do. If you yeah. look at the greats, they do. But most players, to kind of circle back to where we came from, they're scared that they're going to get worse versus getting better. So they, they, they're all in initially, and then all of a sudden, when they get to the fog, as we call it, where mm -hmm. there's a bit of frustration and struggle, which is all part of learning and all normal, they then push back. And the ones that are willing to work through that tend to be successful. The others, that's why you see this circle of instructor changes around players because they're not willing to put themselves in that situation. Do you think the, industry, the golf industry is somewhat to blame of that? Because so many instructors are trying to find their place. And I find that more instructors seem, and this isn't a judgment, I don't mean this the wrong way, but so many people are trying to be, like instructors are trying to be something versus serving the people that they work with. So are they selling a little bit of that? Yeah, maybe. I mean, think about anything. As if you're in your field or mm -hmm. um, our field, everybody wants to try and coach the best players. So they feel like they're going to do whatever they want to do necessary to do that versus developing organically, creating players, have developing your own approach and then having success. And so nurturing and, and getting players to come along that eventually will get to that spot. Everyone wants to get there quicker. They don't want to try and do their hard graft, so to speak. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, social media now, text it, video it. Everyone's trying to get there as quickly as possible as opposed to going through the process to actually learn. Like anything, if you don't do the work yourself and you don't work through it, create your own processes, your own sort of philosophies based on experience, then you really struggle because you're never really owning it. And I think that's where, as our, in, our industry- the owning gets, it is the issue, right? Our industry is that people don't have their own information they, I mean, there's nothing really new in, in some senses, but your approach, the way you look at things, the way that you put the whole piece together, that's got to be unique to you. And I feel like the way I do it may be a little different to how other people do it, but I think all great coaches have that. They, they have the ability to take the macro, Mike, into the micro and help somebody be, to be really good. But as an industry, people give $30 golf lessons. Do you go see a $30 doctor? No, you might um, go to Doc in the Box if you've, you're away yeah. somewhere and you're really sick, but essentially you're gonna seek out people that are experts. The problem is there's way too many generalists, but when you get to player development, it's way more a specialized environment because you're trying to build players up. What are the ingredients necessary? Well, some people don't even know. If you've never coached great players, you'd have no idea what the ingredients are because if you're coaching Mrs. Faversham, her ingredients are not she doesn't have any of the intangibles or any of the really specific right. skill sets needed both as an athlete and as a golfer that you would have if you were coaching Dustin Johnson or Tiger Woods so so it's all very different and as coaches I think our goal is always to improve your skill set and you're always waiting for your opportunity right like the Eminem song you get one shot right the eight mile thing is mm -hmm. like my goal as a coach is to continually improve my knowledge base basically get better at what I do. You mess up along the way, and the whole point of that is what do I take from that relationship and then take it into well, the, into the next about relationship. That, what are the anxieties that you have as a coach? I mean, because as, you know, so many coaches struggle with, and I guess I, me individually too, I mean, you work so hard for players, you want to see them succeed, but separating the value of you as a coach versus the impact you make on the player. Yeah, like you, that, I mean, that's a challenge. You're always, I think, number one, you're, I always, my motto is what's the least invasive approach that's going to have the biggest bang for the buck or the most, the, the most productive in the outcome. And I'm always trying to make sure that you do no harm. I take the medical approach. Like Sometimes you'll give people less because you're trying to make sure that you get buy-in and adoption early and they do the right thing. And some people say, well, that's not enough. Then some people, you try and give them more because you think they can handle it. 
they may not and then they'll say that's too much and so I think as a coach the number one is you're always trying to make sure that you help the person get better they should leave you better as a whole whether it's conceptually or whether it's actually hitting the shot they have a plan right like you've got a guide of this is what you need to do this is the way here's the the process to go apply that but not everybody's going to interpret your information so when we've talked about it before I think the most important thing is your connection with the student and then creating a vernacular that they understand so you have to be a linguist you have to speak many languages and different players need different things and some people interpret information and you're like well that is a complete complete um, contradiction to what I'm saying but that's how you interpret it well that's on me so as a coach I'm always like well did I say that in the right way? How did I present that information? And that's the tough part. So my anxiety is always, I know that the information with the way that we now can measure objectively here at our performance center, I mean, we have 3D, we got force plates, we have video, we have everything you can diagnostically measure, right? I know that the information is accurate because it's objective. There's not, it's, not, it's not subjective anymore as so I think you should do this. It's like, okay, here's what's happening. Now, the tough part is how do you communicate that? That's always my concern is what's the, what's the way? So my anxiety as a coach is don't hinder the person, but at the same time, make sure that the way you communicate is the way they understand so they don't misinterpret it. Because a lot of times people are misinterpret information and it's like, that is not what I told you. It's written down. So the great thing about, um, we use you know, these phones, Coach Now, different apps, and it's like an athlete management system. You write notes, I handwrite them, I put them in there and I'm like, you, you ask the player to basically recant what you said, summarize it, and you're like, okay, you got that. Then a week later, they complain about something and you go, well, can you just go look in your coach now? And it's verbatim what they're supposed to do and they've interpreted the information another way. So that's not their fault necessarily. Might be that they're bad listeners, but I have to do a better job of how do I communicate that. So to me, that's what I'm always working on. I'm, I would say as a player development coach, the actual framework of what they have to do to hit a golf shot. Like a golf ball is about an inch and a quarter, a club is about three inches, drivers, some of them are bigger. The actual skill of standing side onto it and hitting it and making it go somewhere forward so that you can go hit it again and then hit it again and actually put the ball in a hole and develop a score is not that hard. The tough part is the person, the personality there, if you like, willingness to be helped but also at the same time, how did it, how did their communication skills work with you? Some people are very, very much reluctant to share with you, and then then it's like you, they want you to help them, but they they're not willing to be helped. That becomes really difficult. So I'm always communication. Am I doing them any harm? And essentially, how am I going to get them to, to to buy in? And everything's the buying because once someone's all in, now it becomes very easy. And I would say I'm way more in the Bill Belichick, Nick Saban, as a study of coaches, pragmatic, you gotta do this, versus the philosophical, what I would call sort of fluffing approach. Now, you nurture your players, but it's like, if you're not doing the work, you're not gonna get better. Right. And so, how do I communicate how with is, you? How is junior development or player development different here than it was in England when you were growing up? Um, well, it was a lot more of the old school model where you would, you'd have to go do it yourself. Like you'd get a golf lesson occasionally, but you would basically collectively as a group, it was a lot more social learning, which obviously we now know is huge, but there'd be six or eight of us juniors and we'd go on the practice ground, we'd have to shag our own golf balls, you know, and you would yeah. go practice and then you would go play golf and you'd just spend the day, so you, you got think... dropped in the morning and then you got, it was a lot more, um, how would I say? less um there was less service as in our kids here getting a golf cart all these other things yeah, there's, 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 there's yeah. none of that it was all okay like i used to ride my bike to the golf course or i would get dropped off at sunrise like it was always you're there you did your stuff there was nobody catering to you it's like well you guys need to go practice that's how you'll get better there was no over stimulation of instruction and and basically this is the way you have to do it there was no play now back then because you were you allowed on the course yeah yeah but you weren't you had to pass a test to go on the golf course i mean it was very a lot more formal um but it was one of those things where 
once you started playing, it was basically you, you played a lot. Like you just, you went and you hit shots, you went on the golf course, you messed around, you'd play. So we had like a seven hole loop, we had an 11 hole loop where you could play 18 holes. They've since changed the, the nut to two nines, but essentially you would just go out and you might just play seven holes, but you'd go to the practice ground, you'd work all day, you know, and then you'd go play golf. So it was a lot more free play as opposed to all structured. So I say, I'd say that's how it's different, but you, if you wanted to do it, you were, motivated to do it and people didn't know about so we're going back 30 years people weren't into motor learning it the way they are now good coaches kind of things happen but it was a lot more of you had a pro at your club and if the pro was a good player the guy was a good player um, essentially you were just you're just going to go play lots of holes and by a volume that you get better now I think a lot of people struggle because they don't stay with it long enough they think that they should be able to gravitate yeah. to golf straight away. They don't work through uh, yeah. a lot of volume. So, go, so like if I'm going to go play golf and I haven't played in a while, and I know I have a tournament coming, um, and I don't play much now because of kids, but if I do, I know I've got to go through about 10 days to two weeks of like bad golf, but volume of hitting golf shots. Like really frustrating and annoying, but I need to get back in the cycle of playing and then eventually it's like, okay, now I can kind of things come together. But I think a lot of people always see struggle as oh, I'm doing it the wrong way. I'm going to change to something else. Yeah, yeah. there's something wrong with me if I'm struggling. Yeah. And then, so, so the generation that we have now, and I, I'd say it's worldwide. I mean, it's not like it's just centered in the United States. But that's got to be because of the influence of technology. I mean, just like you said, you can diagnose exactly what's going wrong. So if the guy or the girl can't fix it, what's wrong with them? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's a lot more... I'd say my one thing is people have to have ownership to willing to get better. You have to realize that, hey, I'm not very good at that. That's on me. I need to do that. But a lot of times, that's how I grew up. It was never the coach's fault. Well, you're not doing it right. Well, now it's a complete it's now it's inverse. The it's coach. the coach's fault. It's never the kid. Right. So it's, it's very challenging. And with my kids, I try and I'm very much like, well, that's not the coach. That's you. I mean, my kids do martial arts. They're both black belts. And the whole premise of that was... If you fail, which they have failed testings along the way, you have to redo it. You can't just leave. Whereas other things, other teams that they're on, you just get a trophy, everyone's just involved. So I think that that's the tough part now is that as opposed to trusting the coach and letting the kids struggle, failure, first attempt in learning, that whole mm -hmm. doesn't happen anymore. It's like, oh no, that person, this, the coach isn't very good, we'll go to the next person. And then you get this massive cycle where players have got 10, 12 coaches in a very short period of time nobody can take all that much information and then you're going to get a crossover i always say good coaches who've had success with players whether you agree with them or disagree with them they're doing something right because they have success now they may have a very different philosophy from one to another but that doesn't mean that they're necessarily wrong the big issue is when philosophies cross over and the person is in a situation where they're just bombarded with information and that's when you get a lot of these players and it's like well, man, it's, it's too complicated. I don't understand that. Well, it may not be. It's just that they've got so much money, information excuse me, at them that they don't know how to assimilate it. And so that's the tough part is if you want to coach kids, it's less information but in an environment that has free play, that has structure, that has a lot of a in, influence on playing and scoring. Like I say, our philosophy is very score-centric. Everything at the end of the day is about score. You start with swing. But at the end of the day, it's all what's the lowest number that you can shoot. And that's people have to understand that it may not look pretty, but it's effectively get the ball in hole. And that's what the best players do. And that's what we try and do from a player development standpoint. That's all you're trying to do is help someone play better. The ingredients that they have are all going to be different. Some people may do it with ball striking. Some people may do it with short game. Some people may do it with their brain. Physically, you're like, how on earth do you do that? But they're just tenacious competitors and they know how to score. And that's the tough part. So, and that's the tough part as a teacher, though. If you see somebody who, how do they do that is a little unique. But that's, I think that comes from experience. So there's no substitute for experiences. And that's the thing about a coach and having intuition is that you try and look at talent and see what that person has. And then you build around that. So in the initial interview, you're asking them what they think. I always, if it's a new student, I'm trying to get all the data and stats on them that I can, so I can with the AJGA kid, a SJGT kid, if they've got some of Fawcett stuff, if they've got any of Brody's like stat, basically, I can then look at that. Then I take what they're doing and then say, okay, well, have you thought about this? And not everybody is 
totally objective about what their skill set is as well. Some people are yeah. a little on the delusional side of it. So, but as that comes from experience of coaching good players and knowing, well, hey, that player had that and they built around that. And this player had that. Like everybody's different. Golf's tough now though because it's a power game. So, so you, there's, so there's certain attributes. I would say it's no different to playing Premiership soccer in the UK. If you're fat and out of shape and you can't run, you might have all the skills in the world, but it doesn't matter because it's you, a speed game. It's a speed game. It's played very, very fast. Golf's kind of trending that way. Last week at Harbour Town, a little bit different because you take distance out of it. But most of the golf courses are all have a, such a big distance bias that there is a, essentially you need to hit it a certain distance. And if you can't, then it's going to be difficult for you. Now, it's not to say you couldn't do it, but it's like there needs to be some of that. So you have to have certain attributes, minimal requirement, just like going to college. You have to have this to get into this school. Well, to get on the PGA Tour, you need to have this. If you need to get on this tour, you need to have that. So they're benchmarks that you need to look at. It's not to say that there aren't anomalies along the way. They aren't. And my job as a coach is to be able to look at those areas that, they might be high achievers in and say, okay, well, that could offset this. But as a general rule, we have to be objective as a whole of we're trying to build rotary ballistic rockets as kids and players so they can send the ball as far as possible. I want to, I want to switch a little bit about you in a, in a sense that you, you've, you stand in a, in a world of golf instruction with a lot of respect. You write, you speak, you educate, you work, for T, you work with TPI, you educate hundreds and thousands of people across the world every year. Your journey to get to here though is not what most people would actually think. And the only reason I know that is because you and I being such good friends. But I had a conversation with an instructor this morning and, and he was echoing a lot of what you talk about is so many young instructors are coming out with all this technology and they can get to the diagnosis of the problem they don't know how to get them out of it. Yep. You as a young instructor though, I mean from sleeping on golf carts in, in a cart room, right? Yeah. I mean, share that story because I think it's, people think that they're gonna come out, they got all the answers, they read the books, they've looked at the YouTube videos and just get me some great players, I'm gonna take them to number one in the world. Yeah, no, um, so my background is really, I played college golf, oh, I came to America to play college golf, had lots of aspirations to try and play and I would say I'm the ultimate try hard kid so I'm always gonna be one of those people that's guilty of thinking people are lazy or telling people they don't work hard enough because my motto is you're not going to outwork me. Now, it may not be the most gifted, but oh, my gift is work ethic. So I managed to play college golf. My senior year, I played okay, but wasn't never great, but was like, loved working at it. Was always a student of the game. So I managed to get some sponsors um, when I graduated and I played for a while. I had no business really playing, but was trying. And I was getting better and better and better. I still would say if I had enough funding, I would have been great, but I didn't. But the character journey that I went on, in order to do that, I was so willing to do it. I lived in a cart barn. Um, the club I was at in uh, Alabama, a friend of mine, lovely guy, he basically helped me and it was like, listen, eventually I'm not gonna uh, fund you anymore to like play golf, but if you wanna start teaching more, because you're already teaching and you teach a lot, I'm more than happy to help you kind of do that. Well. Teaching more was I taught on a driving range. You were there, yeah. a place called Gunners Landing on a ski slope. It was a black diamond. Yeah, black diamond run with short flight golf balls. And basically I started with a video camera that I saved for and that was it, nothing else. And so I taught- Who'd you start teaching? When? Who? Just everybody, I'd teach anybody, like bad golfers. So, so it was, and the one thing that still to the day is I love the critical thinking, problem solving aspect of it. Like, that's it. Like, that's what, that's what gets me excited of how do I figure this problem out? And so I would go out there for a 30 minute lesson and then the head pro would get mad at me because two hours later, I'd still be with the same person. Well, that hasn't changed. No, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. the worst at yeah. running over. Your, your hours are a suggestion. Yeah, they're suggested. Yeah. So, which is why you can bill high for them. But anyway, <laughs> um, so I then just did lots and lots of volume of lessons. And I tell everybody, you don't get good unless you teach a lot of lessons, like volume of bad golfers trying to fix it because you learn patterns. This is what people tend to do. Okay, so then you assimilate this toolkit of how to teach. Now I had no technology, none. I would say that that was the biggest skill set was volume of lessons with no equipment and having to make people and better. And you would live at the car barn. Yeah, and people got, people got better, and that was it. And then it got 
I would still play. So this is what did help me was section events um, here in a, it was the Dixie section. Now it's the Alabama Northwest Florida PGA. Mm -hmm. um, can't Look, imagine why they changed yeah, that name. But anyway, correct it. Yeah. so played in lots of a tournament. So I was one of the younger guys but obviously better players, so played in the PNC and the national assistants, lots of tournaments, so I could do it and I could talk it. And so now that attracted juniors and kids, and then eventually I kind of got a call from Heath Slocum I'd played mini tours with. Played The one thing about mini tours was all the guys that were on the eventually got to the PGA Tour, they knew me because I was the idiot that was on the range practicing when everyone else was done. I mean. I used to stand there with like two irons thinking if I could master a two iron high draw off the fairway, I'd be, I would all be there. Just rather foolish. But anyway, so people said, well, this kid knows what he's doing. And then Heath asked me to help him. And that was kind of how I got started after like five years of teaching loads of bad players. So it took you really five years to get to a, a tour yeah, player. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't like immediate spontaneous because nobody wants to like trust you and even then it's like okay well how am i going to do this like how, what's the the right approach and so it it took a lot of time and then i really probably made it my passion early on to go see as many instructors i didn't have one mentor so a lot of people yeah, are groomed by you? no yeah. i didn't have one mentor i had lots of people that are really good to me um like a big list of people but i'd go see people and I would talk to them on the phone. There was no real internet at this point. So it was more like reading books and going and watching and observing and seeing people to get lots of different influences. But it was never like, oh, you're an understudy of Butch Harmon or Hank Haney or David Ledbetter, none of that. So in some ways that hurts you because you don't get access to the players, but at the same time, it's good because you're much more rounded and you have lots of different influences and then nobody you've had lots of people help you there's not just one people but I think mentoring huge those people are all massively important to my development but I feel like it was useful because I didn't just have one bias of like this is how you should look at golf it was very much okay does this information work well can I go use it and that was cool as a player it was like trying to implement everything that you were assimilating as from an information standpoint and then once you get one player, then you get another player. And I mean, it's kind of like the second guy I probably got was Robert Carlson in 2007 or eight. I'd already worked with Heath and he'd been really successful, but it's kind of under the radar. Not, I always feel like when you're out working with a player, you're with that player, like mm -hmm. you're there to do your job. So lots of people are social butterflies. I don't really do that. I'm just like, which is probably a hindrance to me, but I'm like there to do a job. I'm there for my players. And that's how I've always been. But in 2008, I think it was actually seven, Robert Carlson asked me at the PGA at Tulsa um, if I would look at him. I only got that because his caddy, Gareth Law, who went on to caddy for Henrik Stenson and a bunch of other players, basically had heard, hey, this guy gives golf lessons, but he never gives the same lesson twice. And that was kind of from a guy in Chattanooga, and that's where Lordy went to school. And that's how I got Robert, and then I helped Robert, and then from then on, the next year, he went to like number six in the world. But it was one of those things, it was, I was kind of in the background, but I'd had a lot of success. Probably didn't market that very well. But from there, it kind of springboarded and lots of players over time. But it took a long time to do it. Um, and I would say that whole 10,000 hour thing, I mean, if you can do 10,000 hours in like, the time it would take to usually do 2,000 hours, I probably did that. Like my wife, once we got married in 03, she used to go bonkers because I'd always be going to see somebody or reading or studying or traveling and trying to get information. So, and still do. Like that's yeah, the thing now. It's one but of I those. But I guess I guess the reason I ask is, and and I wanted you to share that side of it, having known it, because you know I think so many people are fighting for a piece of of the status, right? The, the, from a teacher standpoint, from a coach standpoint, so many people want that piece. What, standing on the driving range, traveling out suitcase, 300,000 yeah. air miles a year, getting shouted at by players? Yeah. That's correct. That's what they want, right? <laughs> I know, I'm, I'm there with you. I mean, I'm... It's one of those things, though, is I think if you aspire to be the best at something, right, you want to validate that you're good and your information is good because if you work with the best players then they should be able to do it and if they do can use your information and it's accurate they should play well so, so that's that's right. would be i think to to everybody's like anyone that coaches a player if they 
say that they don't want to do that at some point. They don't aspire to do that. They're either don't have lofty goals or they're probably not being completely honest. Like you may get into it to specialize in juniors or specialize in ladies golf, but once you start doing it and you have success, you want to test your skill set. You're always trying to get into the bigger pond to see how good you can be. If you're a competitor, so yeah, like yeah, yeah, me yeah. as a competitor, that so I think so that's is the why competitive people... aspect of you the coach. I mean, I know for me working with players, I want to see them personally develop. But there's the competitive aspect of me, is I want to see them succeed. Yeah, now, sometimes I, I'm not gonna say I want it more than they do. That's not true. I know these guys want, it and the men and women want it. And I think the competitive aspect for me as a coach is the fact that I really can't control everything. And so I want to see them succeed. I want to see them have it. And yet I got to remember at the bigger picture, sometimes those obstacles are the greatest learnings that we have. Oh, huge. I mean, I think. But that's so hard as a coach, right? Yeah. But you, you obviously want them to do well competitively. You're only, we say this all the time, you're only as good as the players you coach. Yeah. So if you've got players and they all suck, then you're going to get fired. Yeah. But inherently, you may not be doing as good a job as you could. Now, there's lots of other intangibles you never know about. Like, I mean, people don't understand why players struggle. They think they do. Oh, this person's doing this. It's terrible. But you have no idea about what their background is. Yeah. Just, you, or what their, their home life is. Home life is. Yeah. That's what I mean by background. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so I think it's one of those things. I always want my players to play well. And, you know, my peers who I respect, I might disagree with some, but I respect all of them. You always want your players to be other players. You want your players to go play. My, my perfect wish every week is that the players that I have in the field are all in a playoff together. Yeah. Then I've done my job. Then it's up to them. To, to win right so right and i don't have favorites everybody you, you they're like your children you learn to love the players for who they are and some of their idiosyncrasies because you're putting all of your energy into helping develop them like you don't work with tour players and elite players juniors kids if you're not trying to be vested and nurture them and try and help them and make them better people not just golfers and if you can do that then they generally their performance improves so yeah you're you're wanting them to do well but it's because you care about it like if you don't like people you shouldn't even bother doing it that's a fairly big attribute in the whole in the whole scheme well, of things you you you've got a constant thirst though for information and learning and it's really not out of, in golf, it's a lot of other facets of human performance. And yeah, 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 absolutely. So, I mean, you got to take it from everywhere. I mean, I look at what can I take from other areas, whether it's business, whether it's sports, whether it's psychology, sociology, wh- whatever it is, biology, anything that can help me help people better. Does that make, I mean, yeah. we're in the people business, right? Yeah. So, I mean, sales, like whatever it is, my job is to help somebody get better at their given skill or what they're trying to do. And so where as much influence as I can get from different areas, my job is to then filter through that and then figure out, okay, well, how would that apply to this person or could I use that? So you're just stealing from anywhere. Like you, that's the whole premise as a coach. You're trying to, coaching people is to make them better at what they're trying to do. Teaching is just one attribute of it, but I'm always looking at the influences I can have and being open-minded and I enjoy that. Like it's fascinating just to me, there are things that you can do to help people expedite the learning curve in whichever way and you, you never know where you're going to get it from. Where do you, where do you see yourself 10 years from now? Um, I think I'm going to be in a situation where I've got players that are very, very successful across the board, but I can really spend my time on developing younger players or people that really want to have a passion to get better and create a legacy of where players are playing for a long time, having a lot of success with a very different approach from where we are now, where people are a little bit more rounded. They're a lot more accepting of these are the, these are the buckets that I have to fill to be successful. And I understand it. And and you basically, you've created a, a, a framework and a blueprint for people that has enough variability in it that it allows for lots of different people. And I think that's, I look at someone like Bilicek, but more Parcells and the tree he's had and what he's done. And that's what you're trying to do. So not only am I trying to help players, but you're trying to help other coaches too, to try and evolve, to create something. Do you think the college scholarship hunt is a lot of the problem we see in golf? Like, explain what you mean by that. Well, as you're talking about that is, 
understanding and, and it's almost the patience and, and realization of what the model is. But I find that the unrealistic expectation, this need for perfectionism is almost like college, kids that are, it's coming from the kids perspective a little bit more I see it. Where there's such a need and a push to try to get on a college team that they don't really understand or appreciate what the developmental journey is of golf. It's like if they don't have it by 18 and get that college scholarship, they're never going to have it. Like they miss that window versus becoming a better player, even as an amateur at your own event, at your own course, and being a scratch golfer or an eight handicap, whatever your best can be. Yep. Do you think the scholarship hunt as a college athlete is where this need to fast forward and push it so much is, has happened? Uh, I mean, maybe. I mean, so I think people, everybody's looking at where do they where do they aspire to be and what are their goals? So some people's capacity might be that they want to play college golf. So everything's going to be them trying to do that. Now, I would say people who want to play golf for a living and you want to play the tour, college golf is here nor there. I don't, I don't necessarily think it's relevant. So I think it depends on what you're trying to do. I think college scholarships are a bit of a status symbol as well for people to say, hey, I play college golf. Well, did you really play college golf? Is that what you're trying to do? I think if you're trying to pursue high performance and get better, I would tell you that going to college isn't necessarily going to make, make you better anyway, because mm -hmm. it's, especially if you're trying to ultimately play golf for a living, it's everything, especially high level college golf, they're like players on the PGA Tour. So now when they, if they don't make it to the web.com on the web finals, now all of a sudden they're not flying private they're not playing on yeah, all these. right th yeah. there's no like you don't create that hunger and that sort of grit that you need to play the tour college golf is that whole process is no different i think people are are trying to chase that they're trying to get scholarships um which is great i did it but in the goal that that was just one stop along the journey that wasn't the ultimate destination and i think sure. then then if you're trying to go beyond that Sometimes I don't even think it's a good thing. I think it can hinder you because it, you've got other obligations. If you're truly going to play golf, then if you look at most of the European players, they never did that. They went straight to turn professional, living out a suitcase, understanding what it takes. And it takes a long time to become comfortable with traveling and all of the different stops and obstacles you have to navigate to do that. And college golf doesn't prepare you for that. It goes, you go to class in the morning or at night, where you take them on Online, on, now, yeah. online course now and you go to the golf course you go to qualifying if you don't qualify well then you stay at home and then you wait until you can qualify again like there's not you're not playing tournaments like i would say that it's a great thing college golf love it but it's not for everybody as we wrap up secrets to winning what are your secrets what are the things that you see among your players to say these are the two or three most important things if you want to be a winner you want to win at what you're doing, whether it's win as a teacher, win as a player. Well, I think you have to be, number one, you have to be open-minded and vulnerable and willing to put yourself out there. Like, if you're not willing to, like, really open yourself up to try and learn something or give something or say, hey, look, this could go badly, but as in, you're all in. You've got to be all in, which I think is number one. I think you've got to be relentless about your desire to improve and get better mode you got to be self-starter and motivator like you i can't want it more than the player and the player needs to want it more than me if that makes yeah. sense like you, you always so to me um you got to be open-minded you be, be vulnerable willing to learn um tenacious and relentless in terms of your pursuit of getting better even if it's a little bit everyone looks at getting better as this big rapid change but i'd rather you just do a couple of small things but consistently do them so there's a compounding effect to that um, and I think, I think the other thing too is like, enjoy like what you do and have some gratitude for like, Hey, look, I'm, this is really cool. Like, did I think that I would do what I would do, you know, 10 years ago, I aspired to do it, but you're, do you you'd be thankful that you've got that situation? I mean, and that's it. Every person that comes to you is an opportunity for you to, to help them get better. And you've got to try and sell it to them. Everything you're doing, you have to pitch and sell it. So if you're a coach, or you're an athlete, you've got to like sell it to yourself as an athlete, and as a coach, you've got to sell it to the athlete, so that they're willing to, to like go get it and stay thirsty, stay hungry. Thanks so much for doing my podcast, finally. I've been all over the place, finally get you on mine. For our listeners, hang on. If you check out our Insiders Club through our Facebook page, 
I'm going to have Mark give three tips on what makes better players better and the things that they can do in the moment that will help you play. So if you want to check that out, make sure you check us out on our Facebook page. But Mark, thanks so much for doing this. You got it.